All right, welcome back again to the Runners Connect Run of the Top podcast. As I said before, we're we're here with guest Matt Fitzgerald, who's written a, a number of books about running and training and diet, and um, has also been uh, pretty much an endurance athlete his entire life. Matt, I gave a brief interview a moment ago. Now tell us in your own words a little bit more about yourself. Sure. Well, uh, as you uh, as you mentioned, I've been a runner um, almost my whole life. My dad was a runner, so I, I got that from him. Uh, really started when I was 11, about to turn 12 with, with the running. Um, and my dad also was a writer, and I got the writing thing from him. I was pretty much uh, determined to become a writer my whole life as well. I never really thought about putting the two together. I just considered them separate hobbies and you know one was a career track I knew I wasn't a good enough runner to to make that a, that a career but just you know as as things worked out I ended up having an opportunity to write about running and uh, and other endurance sports um, and um, have been doing that you know really since since a couple of years out of college and I'm, I'm 42 now so that's been a while <laughs> yeah how did you uh at what point or what happened to make you think, oh, I could I could write about running and endurance sports as a career and kind of bring the passion and the and the desire for a career together into one? Well, I got a taste of it when I was still in high school. Um, there was a, a lo- I grew up in New Hampshire, and there was a, a r- really small local newspaper, one of those weekly, not a daily um, newspaper, and there was someone a couple years older than me in, in my high school who who. For some somehow got hooked up writing articles uh, about our own high school track team, you know, just like for the sports page and submitting them. And when he was getting ready to graduate, he said, "Hey, you know, you want to kind of pick up, pick this up after me?" I said, "Sure." I think mean, I got paid like I was like ten to fifteen dollars per article, and you know, I I got to write for publication. Uh, it was a little weird because you know the articles were about my own team. So sometimes, you know, I was mentioning myself in the third person uh, in the article and also had the byline, uh, but the newspaper didn't mind. I, I just would send off the articles. They would appear in the paper, and a few weeks later, I would get a check. Uh, so that, that gave me a taste of it. I didn't necessarily see that leading to anything, uh, but then uh, a couple of years after I graduated from uh, Haverford College, um, I moved out to California, and I, I was just looking for any writing job. I was, I was going to take the first writing job I could get. It so happened that the job I got was with a startup endurance sports magazine. It was a guy named Bill Katowski who had originally founded Triathlete Magazine back in 1983. He was starting up a new magazine called Multisport, which was supposed to sort of talk to all the whole family of endurance athletes from, you know, from mountain bikers to triathletes collectively. I got a job there. That magazine didn't last long, but um, at that point, I had actually quit running. I wasn't running at that point, but it reawakened my passion for running. Uh, you know, I was surrounded by athletes, and um, and I, you know, I, I really enjoyed the work as well. So I thought, you know what, I'm 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 going to kind of stick with this. And you know, that was 18 years ago now. So I've been on that path ever since. That's awesome. That's that's cool that you that you got that opportunity and that it actually pulled you back into running. Yep. Um, how about as an athlete? How did you how did you get into running and then pro, you know progress as an athlete over the years? Uh, my dad ran his first marathon in 1983. It was the Boston Marathon, and uh, back then, uh, most uh, it was a much different race. I think there were only like maybe six thousand official runners, and usually about twice that many people would band it the Boston Marathon back then. So that's how my dad was able to run Boston as his first marathon. <laughs> Uh, very different today, but um, you know, I knew nothing about it back then. I was 11. I have two brothers uh, and and my mom, and we all, we all woke up early one morning, uh, drove down to Hopkinton, and you know, we had picked. Uh, we had a family friend who lived in Boston, so she picked out uh, you know, a, sort of a spectating plan for us, um, and we stopped at a few points along the course uh, and got a chance to see my dad and. That uh, that was a really special year, the '83 Boston Marathon. Uh, Joan Benoit won, uh, mm-hmm. broke the world record that day, so I got to see that. Bill Rogers was kind of at the end of his prime. I think he finished tenth, um, so I got to see him. Um, I think 93 people broke 220 that day. Uh, that had never happened before, and I don't think it's ever happened since. And of course, 
it was the Boston Marathon. It was just, it was an incredible experience. And uh, my two brothers and I actually finished the, the, the race with my dad. We, um, we hooked up with him with a, about a mile to go and just ran the last mile with him. So we, we crossed the finish line and it was just such an overpowering experience um, that I, I wanted more of that. So the very next day, both my older brother and I announced at the breakfast table that we were gonna, going to be runners, uh, and we were as good as our word. I'm pretty sure our very first run was six miles. And back then in the, in the you know, I guess, 80s, you know, kids were so fit just from being outside all the time. That was no problem. Just at age 11, to go out and bust out a, a six-mile run and, <laughs> yeah, and uh, you know, really enjoyed it. It just seemed like a natural thing to do because my dad did it. He never really encouraged us to do it. He just set an example, and it made us want to, to follow it. Yeah, that's cool. That sounds sick. Similar in parts to my story, so I uh -huh. connected with that a lot. Um, you, you know, you've written a, what 19 books, I think. Uh, do you do you have a personal favorite of the books that you've written? Yeah, that's an easy easy question to answer. Um, it's Iron War, the one I wrote about uh, Dave Scott and Mark Allen and their great uh, triathlon rivalry in the mm -hmm. 1980s. That's the only narrative. You know, book uh, I've written, so it's it's storytelling. Whereas I've kind of built my reputation on you know playing the expert, you know, and right, you know, giving people guidance and information to um, you know to become better, more successful, more fulfilled athletes. You know, growing up um, with dreams of being a writer, my dream was to write you know I guess sort of you know literary types of stuff. You know, my dad was a novelist, so. Um, you know, I was an English major, and I had dreams of, you know, winning a Pulitzer Prize or a National Book Award for something, you know, writing things that serious readers like myself en enjoyed reading. My, my dream was not to, you know, be sort of like a how-to type of guy. And it's, it's very meaningful work. It's just it wasn't the original dream for me. So, you know, throughout my career, I've still had those ambitions and sort of, you know, on the side and in spare moments, I've worked on other kinds of projects that would really kind of scratch that creative itch and would, you know, test really, the, you know, m my abilities as a writer, really to write the, write the kind of book that I, I would enjoy, most enjoy reading myself, something that reads like a novel, even though this, you know, this particular story that I chose to tell was a true one. So, you know, it was, it was an immense challenge. You know, I put, put my heart and soul into it. Um, and, you know, I, I'm, I have to say, I'm, I'm pleased with how, how it came out. You know, it just, um, I think if I had written it any earlier, I, I might not have been up to it, but, um, you know, any earlier in my career. Mm -hmm. um, but, and the response has been really good, so I, I guess I'm not the only one who thinks it, it came out well. <laughs> that, that is my favorite. Awesome. Yeah, and that's a, of all the, all the books you have, it is pretty unique and, and, yeah. and it makes a lot of sense. Uh, you know, you've been around uh, world class track and field. Uh, a lot over the years, I think. That's that's kind of the impression I get from reading the stuff that you write, um, be it mm -hmm. in magazines or whatever. Uh, do, do you do you have a craziest or, or coolest story that you know from interacting with with the elite side of the sport? It, it is definitely a, a a facet of my work that I really enjoy. You know, because I I grew up as a fan. You know, and I, mm -hmm. I still am. So when I get to interact, you know, directly with uh, some of the world's greatest endurance athletes, you know, I feel like that a little boy still who's just, you know, getting to live out a fantasy, you know, even though, you know, some of these athletes have become friends or, you know, these people that, you know, I, I have a relationship with, uh, they, there still is that sort of hero factor. Um, usually, you know, there's nothing crazy. I, I haven't shut down too many bars with, uh, with Olympians, but, uh, the most memorable experience I've had was meeting Haile Geber Selassie, um, it is something I wrote about in, in one of my books, but uh, briefly, it was at uh, uh, Highlight came to Los Angeles uh, for Adidas, uh, I think it was back in 2009, um, and I got a chance to go up there with some other press, and uh, Adidas had brought in uh, all of their marquee track and field athletes, so Jeremy Warner was there, um, and it, you know, just a whole mix of just uh, you know, murderer's row of, of incredible track and field talent, but... Uh, you know, it, it was a, I got the sense that it was sort of like fulfilling a contractual ob obligation for all of them, but not for Haile. He's the kind of guy, he's like a Muhammad Ali type where he understands what he means to other people. And when, when, when you meet him or if you get a chance to interact with him, 
he wants to give you something. He wants to give you an experience that's more than just getting an autograph or, or, or something. So uh, the way they arranged it was that uh, each of these athletes uh, took a, had an opportunity to sort of demonstrate their sport, like an aspect of their te technique, like Blanca Vasek did some high, high jumping stuff for us. And uh, they had a treadmill set up. This was at a track, but they had set up a treadmill. Haile was supposed to be sh t demonstrating some technical garments that Adidas had created that show like where the heat is building up in your body or whatever. But he just, he jumps on this treadmill and uh, starts running faster and faster and faster. And uh, there's a there's some uh, pinhead standing next to it, sort of explaining the technical garments and you know how awesome the Adidas gear is. But eventually, nobody's paying attention to him at all, and they're watching Haile just sort of jabbing at the controls on the treadmill over and over and speeding up more and more and more. And eventually, you know, just he just takes over the entire situation. People are just like cheering for him. He starts announcing how fast he's going, and. Uh, <laughs> And, and people are saying, like, go faster, go faster. So eventually he gets up to uh, four-minute mile pace. And the dude is just flying on this treadmill. And the thing I'll never forget is, though, I, I was standing about six feet away from him, but I could not hear his feet landing on the belt of the treadmill. Wow. It was so light and so light on his feet. If, if uh, The way I wrote about it in the book was, like, if he had said, I, Matt, I'd like to run on top of your chest. Can you just lie down on the ground and I'm just going to run on top of you? I would have said no problem because it wouldn't have hurt. Yeah. <laughs> it was so light. Uh, and so, yeah, he ends up running about half of a four-minute mile. Uh, you know, and this probably ruined his training for the day, like, but he didn't care. You know, he just – he was so into just giving back, and he had just such a big – uh, spirit uh, that that he that he wanted to gift his, his fans with that it was a an awesome experience. I got to spend some one on one time with him after that, but uh, really it was just it was it was really really cool. Um, you know, there a lot of lot of athletes out there who just they have the talent and they're good people, but they don't have that charisma. You know, that's that's a rare thing, and, and highly has got that in spades. Yeah, yeah, and. You can tell as he, you know every time he interacts, you can tell that he he's got a, he's got a different different level of charisma, like you said, that yep. kind of transcends everything, and and that's highly yep. uh, yeah, very special. Yeah, exactly. Uh, shifting gears a little bit, um, you know, you you've written a lot about nutrition. Um, seems to be maybe maybe your forte, or uh, or at least one of them. What uh, and this this is actually I say a little bit. This is a lot of a shift. What would you say the most forgotten nutritional aspect for a thirty-five to forty-five year old distance runner is, and and how maybe could that be corrected? Well, what I see very often is that um, people when when they pass age thirty-five uh, runners, they 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 sort of assume, and I guess who wouldn't, that they can continue to to get away with whatever they were getting away with <laughs> in their diet, you know, because, you know, I, I'm one of these people, I don't think anyone needs to eat quote unquote perfectly. I don't, I don't even think that can be defined. You know, I, I think there's, there's room in the diet for a little bit of slack, whether it's occasionally overeating or, you know, having an extra beer on, on the weekend, you know, when you're out at dinner um, or, if, you know, if you, if you like brownies, you know, having, having a brownie after dinner uh, a few nights a week, whatever it is. Um, but, you know, things do change. Um, you know, I've experienced that, and, and, you know, every athlete over 35 I know says, oh, yeah, you know, there came a time when I, when I did the same things, I wasn't getting the same results. And, and usually it's just, you know, you start to accumulate excess body fat, um, mm -hmm. maybe not even necessarily gaining weight, but you just start to get a little softer. And it's like, wait, hey, a minute, hey wait a minute. I'm doing what I always did, uh, and it's just you know your body changes as, as you get older. So I think for that that age bracket, it's important to you know if you want to you know you can't stop the clock you know com completely, but if you really want to sort of you know hold on to your uh, to your or extend your peak years as as an athlete as much as possible, um, then you just you need to be prepared to raise your game and uh, in your diet. Um, and well, I should say training as well, but with respect to diet, that just, that requires that you, uh, take, make an effort to identify where the slack is, you know, what have I been trying to get away with in my diet, you know, in, in what ways is it, you know, two or three steps short of perfection, 
And then, you know, you don't have to make the jump all the way to perfection, but you just incrementally, it's like identifying a weakness, you know, you know, a, as a runner, um, you know, in training and, and racing and, and working on that. Um, so it's going to be sometimes different for, for different athletes, but that's, the process is the same for everyone. It's like, okay, what, where have I been just trying to get away with a little something and where can I tighten up the slack a little bit if it's, you know, if it's cutting down on brownies or paying more attention to, uh, you know, fullness so that you're not sort of robotically overeating, you know, at, at meals, uh, the way, the way a lot of us do. So, you know, it's going to be, everyone's got to solve the puzzle in their own way. Uh, but again, uh, the process is going to be the, the same for everyone. Yeah, that makes makes sense. That's cool. Um, now it's really easy to have a just a garbage diet. You know, we're we're all busy. We're happy to squeeze in a couple miles before or after work, and, and then we go get our fast food, you know, dinner or breakfast or or both. What's the trick to good nutrition consistently um, with a busy, you know, Amer American style life? Yeah, you know, that's a good question for me because I, I'm not um, a cook. You know, I, I'm not someone who likes spending a lot of time in, in the kitchen. Um, and so, you know, I, I have very high standards for my diet, but I can't necessarily, you know, solve the problem of eating well by, you know, spending my entire Saturday at farmer's markets and then, you know, spending 90 minutes every evening preparing, you know, a gourmet super perfect uh, dinner. But fortunately, you know, it, you can you can eat very healthily without putting a lot of time and energy into you know food shopping, food preparation, and it's getting easier. Fortunately, um, you know, there are a lot of options out there, ways to cut corners. Um, you know, things that I will do is um, you know buy packaged, prepackaged, like either boxed or canned soups, like vegetable soups. You know, if you if you get like a, a can of you know, Amy's brand, you know, split pea soup. That's just a can of pure vegetable puree. You know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. it's a good, high quality food. J don't be fooled just because it's in a can, just because someone else made it, and all you have to do is heat it up. That doesn't make it unhealthy. It it is you know just as good as if you made it from scratch yourself. Maybe maybe not 100% as good, but 95%. And you know if you don't love cooking or if you're super busy, you know uh, those types of shortcuts um, can be great. Uh, another one, just to throw out one other example, is uh, you can get um, you know, uh, pre-cooked brown rice now. Uh, you know, it you know, comes in a package and you just bring it home and now it takes like 90 seconds to heat it up and then you add whatever you want to, to put on top of it or, you know, use it as a side dish or something and boom, you've got, you know, a very nutritious whole grain as part of your meal and you put exactly 90 seconds into preparing it. So, you know, just understanding that um, it doesn't have to be all or nothing. You know, you can have high standards for your diet and everyone knows what quality... Let's face it, you know, vegetables, you should eat a lot of, you know, cupcakes, you shouldn't eat a lot of. So that part, you don't have to have a, a ton of knowledge. You know, you know what healthy food is. The, the important, important thing to recognize is that, you know, you can, you can have the healthy diet um, without being, you know, a, a gourmet chef. Right. Yeah. So uh, basically take that extra couple minutes when you're shopping to look around for the stuff that is, is still – you know, reasonably high quality food and, and, and high high nutrition, but not, you know, you, you don't have to buy all raw necessarily or right. stuff like that. Yeah, and once and when you, you only have to figure out each of these tricks once, right? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like my little my little canned soup shortcut. You know, I I got the inspiration. You know, I don't know, maybe ten years ago. Hey, you know. Why don't I just do that? And of course, I've been doing it ever since. So you know, you sort of add up these little tricks uh, that that work for you, that work in your life. And once you've checked the box, you don't have to. It's not like you have to reinvent the wheel every week when you go shopping. You know, you can, so it gets easier and easier as time goes by. Yeah, no, that that makes sense. Um, what supplements or, or or are any supplements important? Especially again, go, kind of going back to that thirty-five to forty-five ish age group. Yeah, you know, um, you know, some sports nutritionists are very pro supplement. You know, they they've almost never met a supplement they didn't like. They're <laughs> they're ready to believe, you know, the research on on anything, no matter what. Uh, and then there are others who are very anti supplement. You know, they they kind of assume they're all poison or that it, you know it's just 
giant government conspiracy. I don't know. But, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm very pragmatic. I, I, I'm sort of in, in the middle on supplements. I, I don't think there are many supplements that many runners actually need. Um, you know, if you're anemic, you need an iron supplement. There's just no, no two ways about it. So there's, there, there are cases where an individual runner absolutely does need a supplement, but there, there aren't many. Um, you know, it's, it's often, uh, uh, good for one's perspective to look at the East African runners and, and who are the best in the world and, and how they do it, what they don't have. You know, they, mm -hmm. they don't have, you know, state of the art health clubs, you know, with all kinds of fancy gym equipment. So apparently you don't need that to be a world class runner. And they also don't have nutritional supplements or not, you know, not many of them do. So it, that's a pretty good sign that a really good diet is, is going to be enough to do the job. Nevertheless, you know, there are some supplements out there that can be uh, useful. I, I generally recommend that um, all runners and, in fact, all human beings uh, take an essential fatty acid supplement because essential, uh, essential fatty acids are, as their name suggests, essential. <laughs> you know, you absolutely have to have them in the diet, and not many of us get enough of them in our regular diet. So the research there is all good. It suggests that you know, there's no harm. Um, if you eat a lot of fish, you may not need it, but it's still going to be there for you as insurance. And, you know, if you go a week or two and you just happen to not eat any fish, well, you've got that supplement kind of looking out for you. Um, another one that, that I think is needed by more runners than, than most others is uh, vitamin D. It depends on where you live. It just depends on your skin color to, to some extent, whether you, but there's a, uh, Low vitamin D levels are pretty widespread. It's, a, it's one of the more common nutrient deficiencies, and it, it can mess up your health and your running. Um, so it's um, that one. It's not one that, that, you know, that everyone needs, but some people do. I, you know, I live in California where it, it's 60 degrees and sunny in January. You know, I'm outside all the time. I'm fair-skinned, so I don't take a, a vitamin D supplement. I, I, certain, uh, I don't need one, but there are those who do. So there's, like, you know, individual cases like that. Yeah, what the low vitamin D or vitamin D deficiency? What does that what does that lead to? Well, in uh, in for general health, you know, it, it's implicated with a, a, a wide variety of um, of chronic diseases. It's not going to be the single cause, but it can of something like certain cancers. Mm -hmm. But you know, it, big epidemiological studies have found that um, low vitamin D levels are uh, more common in individuals that develop uh, certain cancers and other chronic th diseases. So it's like not, not a one-to-one -one type of thing, but it's something that can increase your predisposition for those types of things. Uh, in runners, um, uh, low vitamin D, there's not a, a ton of research out there, uh, but low vitamin D levels can just uh, s sap your energy levels for training. So it'll just make you lethargic, um, and, you know, if you, it's one of those things where you just like, man, I'm just feeling flat in my training and I, I don't know why. Uh, you know, it could be something like iron deficiency, but it also could be vitamin D deficiency. There's a, a research showing that athletes who, who live in sunnier places um, tend to uh, per perform better. And it's one of the reasons that all athletes in all environments tend to perform better in the summer yes, because they're getting, they're getting more sun exposure. For those who don't know, your, your body can make vitamin D through sun exposure. I've been assuming everyone knows that. but um, So, yeah, so um, I, I don't think all the mechanisms are, are fully understood, um, but it's one of those things where, you know, a vitamin like vitamin D has so many roles in your body that if you're not getting enough of it, you know, it could cause a, a breakdown in a, a number of, of different systems. Yeah, and that makes that makes a lot of sense because there were a lot of. I went to school and ran in school in uh, just outside of Asheville, North Carolina. So our winters were longer than I preferred and and a lot colder than I preferred. Right. And I always trained way better in the summer than in the winter. And that. Yeah, of course, there's more than one reason for that, but right. Apparently, you know, s a limited research suggests that just simply exposure to sunlight is one of them. That's that's fascinating. That's really interesting. Um, now, Matt, you you were an early proponent of heart rate monitors. Uh, in your opinion, what's the benefit to using a heart rate monitor and or a GPS watch? Uh, or I guess just technology. What well, utilizing that technology as as your training on a daily basis? What are the benefits of that? Yeah. So you know, 
there, there's a reason that races are run on the clock, right? Um, you know, I point out in my in my book on mind body running, which everyone expects to be a book about you shouldn't wear a watch and leave the GPS at home, but it's actually not. And um, you know, before before you know uh, modern timing methods came around, there were never races with dozens or hundreds or let alone thousands of people like today's big city marathons because if you weren't fast enough to win or 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 at least have a chance of winning a race there was absolutely no point in lining up think about it think about a race with no clock with 10,000 people in it you know and only 5 of them have a chance to win why would the other you know why would the other thousands even even bother it made no sense but when when races started to be timed then everyone could compete at least against themselves and there's really good research showing that when you have some kind of outside uh, performance standard, something you're measuring yourself up against, whether it's other athletes or time, you perform better. Uh, you know, that's the way our, our psychology is wired, that we'll, if, you, if I just tell you to go out and, you know, run five miles as fast as you can, simply by feel, all by yourself, and no watch, well, okay, you may feel that you ran those five miles as fast as you did, but guess what? If I put other competitors in that race, or if I put you on the clock, you will run faster. Right. So this is a long-winded way of saying that uh, time helps push you to run faster. Um, and, you know, you, it, you can use it to your advantage in races, but also in training. Now, the number of workouts where you actually want to push yourself, um, you know, to kind of, you know, test your limits is not, not that many. You don't, you don't want to do that every day in training, uh, but, but, you know, using... You know, time and distance information in your training can help you aim higher, try harder, and also, you know, track improvement uh, throughout the training process. So it's a very useful tool. It can be double-edged, though, because if you, you know, I've succumbed to this myself where, you know, I was wearing my, my GPS watch every day and I started to just push myself when I shouldn't. Um, and that's where heart rate monitors are super useful, whereas... Whereas time and distance kind of helps you uh, push when it's time to push, heart rate monitors are really useful for uh, dialing back when you need to dial back, which is actually more often in training. You know, right. you have, you know, maybe you know five easy days for every two hard days or, or whatever in your training. So you know, the typical run where you're just going out and logging eight miles at a at a moderate intensity, if you have a heart rate monitor and you sort of know where your appropriate zones are. Heart rate, data, heart rate data is not a performance metric. You know, you can't look at your heart rate and say, oh, man, if I can get it two beats higher, you know, this will be an awesome workout. That, that doesn't make any sense, you know what I mean? So whereas pace can seduce you into running faster when you shouldn't, it's easier to use heart rate as a ceiling and say, okay, I don't want to be above this, um, you know, above this number for today because it's supposed to be an easy day, um, and, and it will help you, you know, avoid going too hard when, when you don't want to go too hard. Yeah, uh, and you mentioned when we were talking before uh, a connection with Pair Sports, a heart rate monitor company. What, what, what's your connection with them? What are they? Yeah, yeah. Thanks for asking. Uh, Pair Sports is a is a fairly new company. Uh, they've been around for a year and a half or so. And you know, one one there's a reason that not every runner trains with a heart rate monitor, right? Yeah, I think you know actually only a small minority do. Uh, because you can't just strap one on and and automatically start getting the full benefits out of it. I mean, there are some great runners who used heart rate monitoring effectively in their careers. Paula Radcliffe comes to mind. Right. You know, she, she used heart rate based training, uh, set a world record. <laughs> um, but for a lot of people, in order to use a heart rate monitor effectively, they almost felt like they had to be a coach. You know what I mean? It's like, well, how do I know what my zones should be, and how do I? create a, you know, a heart rate based training program that makes sense for me, you know, that's customized to my fitness and my, my goals. So pair sports came along and sort of solved that problem in, in one fell swoop. What it is, is it's an audio based heart rate based training system. So you strap on a monitor and a pair of earphones. Um, and it's, uh, there are two versions of it. One is just a small device that looks a little bit like an iPod shuffle. Another is just an app you can download onto a smartphone. But uh, when you do workouts with the pair sports, you'll actually hear a coach. I'm one of them. I'm one of their primary coaches. <laughs> guide you step by step through a workout. So it's almost as if you hired a coach who rides a mountain bike next to you every time you run, and the device figures out all of your zones for you. So you just you just 
try it the first time, run for 20 minutes, and the, without ever even knowing what zones mean or doing any math whatsoever, the device remembers, and then every workout you do after that is customized to your zones. But rather, unlike so many other devices out there that are just like a robot, like Hal, Hal the computer, you know, just saying, good job today, you know, <laughs> you ran five miles, you're actually hearing a coach that you know, you know, give you prompts. Like, if you do one of these pair workouts, you know, you'll start up and you'll hear me say, this is what we're going to do in this run, this is why we're doing it, um, you know, I'll give you a warning in 30 seconds when the first interval is about to get, begin. You know, I'll tell you when you're above or below your zone. Uh, when I think you might be, um, you know, if you get at a, to a point in a hard workout where your form might be falling apart, just as I would do if I were physically present with you, I would say, hey, relax those shoulders. You know, I know it's getting, uh, it's getting to the uh, difficult point of the workout, but you need to hold your form together. So, you know, it's, a, it's just everything that you would get from, a real human coach who was physically present with you. So you get the heart rate based training, but that whole learning curve or the need to be your own coach is just wiped away. So it's kind of, you know, that's a company that I happen to be familiar, affiliated with, but I think that is sort of the future of heart rate training. So, you know, it, it, it has the same advantages that it always had, but some of the disadvantages or limitations have been dealt with, you know, through, through technology. Yeah, is that um, with pair? Is that a uh, you buy the device and it, that all is all inclusive, or is that a is that kind of a pay by the month thing? Yeah. So the way it works is um, the uh, if if you get the uh, the the smartphone app version, the app itself is free. Uh, there is you have to get the uh, the heart rate monitor and the earphones that are specific to it. Um, okay. Um, and that's that's really your only purchase. Um, and then. Uh, the, all of the content is uh, you can access, let's just focus on the, the smartphone app. Uh, through the app on your phone, you can access uh, all of the various workouts and training plans, and there are hundreds of them. Um, some of them are pre premium content that you would pay an extra fee for, but there's no subscription. Uh, you know, you just you buy, buy the hardware and you're good to go for your entire career as a runner, and you could easily go through an entire career as a runner and never purchase any of the premium content. You know, I, I created a library of every conceivable workout that any runner would ever need to do. It's like 128 workouts, and they're all free. So you could, you could, for example, if you know, if you're comfortable being self-coached, you could, you could create entire training plans with those workouts alone, which are all free. Or you could have a coach use those workouts to to create plans. Um, for you, but there are, you know, like for example, um, you know, I have a, a book called Racing Weight, and another one called The New Rules of uh, Marathon and Half Marathon Nutrition, and I've created pair sports training plans based on the the plans in those books. So, you know, it's one thing; it's nice if you have, a, you know, a, you know, a nice plan on a piece of paper, you know, at home, you know, and you can look through it and say, oh, this is great. But then you go out and do the workout, and you could easily kind of screw it up or forget exactly. Wait a minute. Was it six intervals of four minutes or, you know, four intervals of six minutes, that kind of thing. So if you get, like, the pair version of, of those plans, um, you pay a little bit, but then there's um, – it's kind of foolproof that you can you – can, you can, you're guaranteed to be able to execute it um, exactly as it was intended because you have my voice in your ear guiding you through every single workout. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. That's, that's a cool service. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not for everyone. You know, there are, there are some runners who are, like, very confident in their own ability to coach themselves who, you know, they might not have any use for this. But for a lot of runners, it really is, it's a godsend, you know, because it, 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 if you just simply do what you're told, you know, you cannot screw up your training. And, and uh, you know, that that's, that is a pretty cool thing. Uh, and something, you know, there's never been anything quite like it before. Yeah, and that's, like you said, that's kind of, Probably the future of, of being self coached as a runner, yep. and uh, you know even Runners Connect we we've been developing this algorithm that'll actually that coaches athletes and you know they they go in and they log their workouts every day and and over time it or it, you know it has an original training plan and then as they're as they're logging their workouts it's it shifts the training plan and it's all it's all algorithm based which is you know when they when they introduced that to me six weeks ago when I got hired I was like. What an incredible concept, you know. So yeah, yeah. It's kind of that's uh, you know that's my brain doesn't work that way. I, those people who can t like turn a, a logic, a coaching logic, into actual math, 
uh, for you know computer code. Uh, my hats my hats off to those guys. <laughs> That's a talent I do not have. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm the same way. So you know, pair sports, same same thing. Like, wow, what an what an incredible you, you got this guy Matt Fitzgerald who's gonna who's gonna coach you based off of his training plan in this book that you bought, but then he's actually going to be, you know, you can get this app that where he c- converses with you essentially during workouts. That's that's really neat to me. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm enjoying it. <laughs> I bet. Now, uh, strength training for runners. Um, the last couple weeks, a couple interviews ago, I talked to Jeff Gaudet, um, and then after that I talked to Phil Wharton, and obviously, you know, Phil – active isolated stretching and, and kind of strength training through or, or, or maybe not strength training necessarily but making it so that you can continue to do strength training through through it, active isolated flexibility um, and the two of them really talked about that a lot. What are your thoughts on on strength training and you know the preventative benefits of being stronger as an athlete, as a runner specifically? Yeah, so um, you know, I alluded earlier in the interview to the fact that I had sort of given up running for a while. And that was that actually fell between the end of high school and, and roughly age 26. There's, there's actually a gap of about eight eight years there when I wasn't running, and what I was doing was actually lifting weights. <laughs> I got I became a total gym rat and was like, you know, all about like increasing my maximum bench press, and so I I never enjoyed weightlifting as much as I did and do enjoy running. Uh, but I got into it. I got to sort of like it. So when I got back into running and then into triathlon after that, I kept on lifting weights. You know, I dialed it back and stopped bench, bench pressing. But, you know, it wasn't, whereas for a lot of runners, it's a real chore, you know, to find time to go to the gym. They're, they're weak, you know, <laughs> they, they don't enjoy it. And so it's like, why bother? Um, I never had that problem. So I was willing to invest myself in it. So I got to see for myself what the, what the benefits are. And, my attitude is, you know, as a runner, you want to be as strong as you possibly can be without compromising your actual running, you know, which you could do by gaining too much muscle mass um, or by well, lifting weights so hard that you're, you know, too tired to, to, mm-hmm. to do track workouts. But aside from those factors that you want to avoid, the stronger you are, the better, you know, because strength is one of the components of speed. Um, and you know, there are other things that are sort of, you know, kind of running specific benefits of strength training that are specific to runners that are different than other sports. Uh, for example, you know, uh, both maximum, maximal type of strength training and plyometrics or power training has been shown to enhance running economy. And it does that by actually making your legs stiffer on impact with the ground. Um, it's about half the energy you use when you run is actually free. Uh, that you get from from landing on the ground, you know, the whole equal and opposite thing. You land with a certain amount of force, the ground sends force into your body, and you can capture a certain certain amount of that and reuse it for free. It's not energy that your body has to generate. Um, And when your legs are stronger, uh, it's sort of like, you know, your legs function as a spring. And if you have like a, imagine like a pogo stick that's kind of old and rusty and kind of loose, and you land on the ground and you just feel this kind of soggy give and you don't get much back, that's the runner with weak legs, uh, whereas you know a really super tight and bouncy pogo stick is the equivalent of a runner with strong legs. So you're you're sort of bouncing off the ground, and it improves your running economy. You, you don't have to come up with as much of your own energy to run fast. So the benefits aren't just injury prevention, although those are there too, um, but also it will enhance your performance. So you know it's it's worth it. You know it's a matter of. You know, running is a hobby for most of us. So if you're like, you know what, I just it's it's not worth it. I don't I don't care. You know, I want to be good, but I don't want to do every last thing to be as good as I can be. And and I can I, I can skip the weightlifting. Fine. You know that that's your choice. But the fact is, you know, it is one way to a get injured less and b perform better. So you know, if you care enough, by all means, you know, make it a part of your training. Yeah. And do you you have a book where you kind of cover strength training, right? Yeah, you know, I've covered it in, in, a, in a few of them. Um, yeah, it's a, a topic I, I come back to. I, hit, I definitely hit it in, in the racing weight uh, books. Um, I cover it in brain training for runners. Uh, there's a chapter called brain training as cross training, or cross training as brain training, rather. Because okay. um, a lot of the things you do with cross training uh, or strength training, let's say, they, they don't necessarily 
Take, for example, like uh, your abdominal muscles, uh, especially some of the, the deeper postural ones. The problem with those muscles in runners is not that they're too weak necessarily. You don't need to, those muscles don't need, you're not lifting anything <laughs> with your, your abs when you run. Right. The, the problem is that your, your, your brain literally does not know how to find them. It never uses them in everyday life. So that sort of the, the lines of communication between your brain and those muscles have just, they've just fallen into disrepair. So strength training can actually, aside from making you stronger, some of those little stabilizing muscles that can simply help your brain communicate with them effectively so that you can use them uh, as they're meant to be used uh, when you run. So, yeah, um, yeah, I, I've hit that topic of strength training in, in a number of my books. Cool. So is there one, um, you know, one of our listeners is like, okay, I, I have no idea about strength training. Um, is there one that you would say is kind of a starting point? Yeah, for for runners, for sure. The, the brain training for runners is, is the most comprehensive treatment of strength training that is specific to runners. Racing weight is for all endurance athletes, so I have like suggested exercises that are good for rowers and cross country right. skiers. So it's broader, um, and yeah. So the brain training one is is more focused. Okay, cool. That'll. Uh, I actually um, have flipped through brain training for a guy who was coaching me a couple years ago based I think a lot of what we did off of off of brain training so it was I got really fit while while we were doing all that so I, I guess it helped <laughs> yeah, <you're. laughs> um, now I, I kind of got excited earlier and, and jumped on talking about strength training moving back real quick to uh, you know technology and heart rate monitors GPS watches and how we can utilize them um, are there any negatives that you've seen to you know running every day with a heart rate monitor and a GPS watch? Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, for sure. Uh, you know, especially, you know, I, I did allude to the, the limitations of using uh, GPS or, you know, monitoring your pace, uh, mm -hmm. you know, every day, because that, that is a performance metric. And so, you know, if you're a performance-minded runner, it can seduce you into running hard when, when you shouldn't. Um, and also, you know, let's face it, you know, running is the simplest of sports, and a big part of what makes it so enjoyable is that, especially in our increasingly technologized lives, you know, going out for a run is a chance to break away from all that um, and just be in touch with nature. So, you know, it's not all about performance. It's also about just the experience of, of running. And, and so, you know, it's just nice to leave the technology at home on a given day uh, for that as well. And then, you know, uh, another point that, that is often made in this regard is the, the whole technology dependence type of thing. Um, you know, numbers are great because they do, they sort of give you a measuring stick and they, they, do, uh, they do incentivize you to, to you know, dig a little deeper and, and reach a little, a little higher. But ultimately, you know, w when you uh, tow the starting line and run a race, uh, it's your body and your feel for your, your body's limitations and capacities that determines how fast you go, right? Um, right. You know, I, I had an experience a number of years back where I ran a, a half marathon, and I was in pretty good shape for it, and, you know, I, I wanted to run, uh, I had a certain time in mind that I, that I thought I, I could run, which would have been a, a, a PR. Um, well, I ended up running three minutes faster than that, <laughs> So I ran, it was one of those just magical, incredible days where it just all came together and I just you know, blew my own expectations out of the water. But if I had been too tied to my watch, I wouldn't have allowed myself to do that. In order to you know, really have that, that kind of breakthrough type of performance, ultimately you have to be able to ignore what the watch is telling you and, and really know your body and say, you know what, I have more than I thought I did. Of course, more often it works the other way, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that, <you're, laughs> that your body is just, you know, not ready to perform at the level you hoped. And again, you know, if you're too reliant on, on the numbers, you could set yourself up for disaster, right? You know, run the first eight miles of a marathon at a pace that you're just, you're just not ready to sustain. You blow up and you don't even finish. Whereas if you're dialed into your body, you could recognize three or four miles in, you know what, I just don't have it like that today. I'm going to make an adjustment, you know, make the best of what I do have today. So, yeah, you know, there are various ways that technology can, can lead you astray, for sure. 
Right. But basically, you know, you utilize the heart rate monitor and the GPS watch and, and you know, that genre of uh, supplementary devices in, in a fashion that will let you just train more intelligently, basically. Yeah. But not yeah. over – don't become over-dependent. Right, exactly. They're, they're, they're tools. You just need to know that you make sure you're in control of them versus vice versa. Yeah, exactly. Um, now, you, you know, you've written a couple books about weight. You've talked about uh, racing weight a couple times now in this interview. Um, let's just say, for, for example, that I or whomever uh, have taken, you know, a year or two off of training and you know, moving, starting to get back into it, maybe 25 or 30 pounds over racing weight. What's the most healthy plan um, or line, you know, plan of attack to get like 10 or 15 pounds over racing weight where you, you're at a good training weight and you can, you can kind of then approach running as, as a competitive runner and not as a, uh, you know, overweight ex-competitive runner. Right. <laughs> Yeah, so um, here, here's what I would recommend. You know, in my racing weight book, um, there's there are six different um, I call them steps. Uh, they're not necessarily sequential, but uh, six different strategies that um, uh, that you can use to to uh, you know manage your weight and body composition. The most important one is in improving your diet quality, the overall quality of your diet. So. That is, is where you need to start. So I have a tool in that book. It's called the Diet Quality Score. Um, and it's just a way to, you know, the thing is we all think we eat healthier than we actually do. So the Diet Quality Score is a very simple tool. It's much easier than even counting calories. Um, but it, 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 it forces you to sort of look in the mirror in terms of where your diet is, um, and where it measures up in overall quality. And, you know, the the the, the single most effective thing you can do um, to lose excess body fat is to raise that score. And it doesn't have to get up to perfection. Perfect score happens to be 32. I don't tell you, you know, get 32 every single day as long as you live. That's not necessary. It's not sustainable for most of us. But anything you can do to raise it up, um, you know, either by, you know, eliminating low-quality foods or adding high-quality foods or, or what have you, um, you know, you can figure out the way that works best for you for your lifestyle. But that score is, uh, you know, numbers don't lie. Um, so when you see it going up, um, that's where you want to begin, you know, before you even think about, you know, supplements or you know, other steps that are in, are in the process, like nutrient timing, like when you eat. Well, that's important, but if you're only going to do one, you know, improve your diet quality or look at, you know, how, you know when you eat, the timing of your of your meals and snacks, definitely start with, with the quality piece. And then you can sort of, you know, People can be overwhelmed if they try to fix everything at once, um, and that's the reason it, it does kind of make sense to think of the steps of the racing weight plan as steps. So you can maybe start with diet quality, and then there's another one is uh, managing your appetite. So that one's all about sort of learning. You know, we talked about listening to your body. Well, it works with nutrition and diet too. You start to pay attention to what does what what is it really like to eat enough for me, or when when am I eating when I don't actually need to eat or you know am i am i eating you know this much food at dinner simply because i serve it on a giant plate or just because i'm eating in front of the television and i'm not really paying attention to how full i am so you, know, you might want to you know start with diet quality and then layer in the appetite management piece after that and you know you'll make so much progress with the diet quality thing but you'll make even more with the appetite management piece and then then you can layer in nutrient timing and then you know, step by step by step, you know, you're easing into it, you're not becoming overwhelmed, but you're, you're doing the, the heaviest lifts first. The things that will give you the most results are going to come, come up front because, let's face it, there's nothing more motivating than seeing progress. So, yeah. you know, if you see a couple pounds come off in that first week, you'll be like, okay, you know, this is, re this is really happening. But, you know, there are some people who can just jump into it. They're like, okay, I'm 30 pounds over in weight. I'm going to make a comeback. I am going to fix everything at once and, you know, more power to them if they can, if they can sustain that, but it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. Um, and then you know, so that's the nutrition side. There's the whole training side too, of which you can obviously use not just to get fit, but also as a means of of losing excess body fat as well. Um, and you basically, so uh, 
take the nutritional side and then, you know, also while being intelligent with your training and, and you know, easing back into it at a reasonable um, pace or, or whatever. Yeah, but that's another area where cross-training can be super beneficial because, you know, you know, running is a high-impact activity, so you're, there, it always has a higher risk of injury than, than right. other, you know, non-impact activities do, and never more so than when you're overweight, right? You know, sort of, you know, it's kind of a catch-22. You know, when you need it most, it's, it's most risky. Um, so, you know, if you have a non-impact alternative, you, you know, maybe you, you could handle, say, you know, 80 minutes of exercise a day, but you couldn't handle 80 minutes of running, you know, because you're starting over and you're overweight. Well, go ahead and use those 80 minutes, but maybe it's only 20 minutes of running to start with and an hour of, you know, riding a bicycle or, or whatever. So that can give you greatly accelerate your progress, whereas if you're totally dependent on running, it's sort of running or nothing, well, it's going to be a lot longer at, with just 20 minutes of running, 20 minutes of total exercise a day to, to lose those 30 pounds. Yeah. Excuse me. Absolutely. Uh, with with cross-training, what do you, what's the most effective or efficient cross-training in your, in your opinion? Well, um, I, I, when we're, if we're talking about alternatives to running, it's a, in cross training, years and years back, I wrote a book called Runner's World Guide to Cross Training, and in it, I, I define cross training very broadly to include uh, alternative uh, cardio activities, stretching, strength training, you know, anything other than running that was exercised that a runner right. might do. But if we're really talking just about more traditional alternatives to running type of cross training, then what you want to do, the more specific it is to running, the better. Um, you know, I have found through experience as a triathlete that bicycling uh, gives you a lot of fitness that transfers back to running, but other things are even better. Um, that's why, um, you know, the Alter-G treadmill is, if you can afford it, <laughs> right. because you actually are running. You know, you're just running at a fraction of your of your full body weight. So... You're going to get the most specific, you know, running specific benefit from something that is is so similar to running that it actually kind of still is. That that's why elliptical trainers were invented. They were invented as to to simulate the running motion without without impact. That that's a pretty good option, but um, elliptical trainers are really boring. That's why I actually have one of these elliptigo bikes. Have you heard yeah. of elliptigo? Those are really cool because. Uh, they're the same thing as an ellip elliptical trainer in terms of the specificity to running, but you can actually go outside and cover 30 miles on one of those things and have, you know, a fun adventure outdoors, um, and you don't want to put a ball through your head like you would after 20 minutes on, a, on an elliptical trainer. <laughs> indoors. So that's, uh, but there are lots of alternatives. I, there's one that I actually use, um, you know, not, you know, Alter Gs are expensive, elliptigo bikes are kind of expensive, but one thing you can do is, is take your treadmill or the treadmill at your gym, crank up the gradient of the belt to the maximum, which is usually 15 degrees, mm -hmm. and just walk at a pace that um, is roughly equivalent in terms of heart rate or overall eff effort to like, you know, a moderate intensity run. Mm -hmm. um, there's research showing that actually, if you if you really um, walk, if you walk br briefly up a steep hill your brain is using exactly the same motor pattern that it would use to run up a, up a steep hill. If you can kind of experiment with it. If you, if you get right to that limit where you want to transition from walking to running, you know what I mean? It's like, oh, I'm kind of walking too fast to walk. I need to run. Or now, you know, I'm running so slow that I might as well walk. You can, you can dial into that point where you're actually running and walking are, are, are basically the same thing. There's no real difference because you're going up a steep hill at a, at a moderate to you know, moderately brisk pace. So I, I use that sometimes, where it's it's basically low to non-impact. It's you know anyone can access a treadmill. A lot of runners don't want to think of walking as something that could benefit them, them but yeah. but I do a fair amount of it, and it, it works pretty well. Yeah, we we actually in college, like I said, we were Asheville, North Carolina, you know, uh, Smoky Mountains. Um, and we, we had a bunch of trails connected to our college campus, and our off days a lot of times were. Um, coach would we'd show up to practice and coach would be like well today we're going to go on a two hour walk and uh, you know we'd go hit the trails and it, you know you're walking up a mountain essentially and, and yeah. uh, 
we were all college age distance runners who were competitive, so we were pretty much race walking the whole time. So, right, you know, we that's interesting that uh, you bring that up because I never even thought of that as cross training. I just thought of that as, I mean, you know, obviously we saw it a little bit as cross training, but we were just racing each other while walking because right. we, we weren't gonna <laughs> we weren't gonna overdo it by by race walking each other up the mountain, you know. Right. Um, so that's 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 fascinating. That's interesting. Um, you you know you've mentioned your book Brain Training a couple times, and uh, I'm a, a little bit familiar with it, uh, like I said. But I think the premise of the book is training your brain to uh, know your body better, and, and and that way you have better body control and, and things like that. Is is that right? Is that accurate? Yeah, I would I would frame it even more broadly than that. But go ahead and, and finish your question and, and okay. Well, just talk. Just I just wanted you to talk about uh, you know just real briefly, kind of give a synopsis of the book, I guess, or or, or why that's a, a beneficial thing for runners. Sure. Um, well, you know, the, the brain really is uh, controls every single aspect of the running action and the running experience. Um, you know, even things you wouldn't even think of, like, you know, when you start running um, on either a cool or especially a warm day, it's going to be 90 degrees here in California today, um, <laughs> and you, you know, at first you're not sweating, you know what I mean, the first two, three minutes of a run, it's already 90 degrees, but why aren't I sweating? Um, and eventually you start to sweat, and then you start to sweat more. Well, your brain is controlling that. Your, your brain is deciding exactly how much you need to sweat. So you couldn't even sweat. All these things that you think of as, oh, my body's just taking care of this. Or think of the balance of fuel sources that your muscles use. You know, at, at a lower intensity, it's, it's mostly fat. At a higher intensity, it's mostly carbohydrate. Um, well, guess what? Your brain controls that as well. It simply couldn't happen unless your brain was calling the shots and saying, Here's what my body needs. Um, and then there are the other aspects of running that you would, you would think of the brain as controlling. For example, your sense of pace. Um, you know, if you go out and run a, a 10K race and you're an experienced runner, you know how, how fast you should be running 1K into that 10K, right? Well, how do you know that? It's, it's a sense of feel, and that, that sense of feel is seated in your brain, you know, based on... Uh, past experiences and your brain's ability to sort of project forward. Okay, if it's this painful now, I'm pretty sure it won't be you know too painful before I hit the finish line. But I'll be right at my limit, which is of course where I want to be. To be. So your brain is just completely in charge of everything. And um, you know traditionally uh, the brain was just ignored by running coaches because you couldn't see inside it. But that's really changed within the last 15 years, and we're learning a lot of cool stuff about exactly what your brain. Is doing, and it's um, a lot of it is stuff that actually makes a difference. It's not, it's not like, oh, you know, stop the presses. We've been training wrong, you know, up to this point because we weren't considering the brain. It's not like we're starting over, but we are learning stuff that does, you know, that suggests that we might want to tweak certain things that we do about how we approach the sport. So, the the brain training book really tries to, uh, you know, kind of sell that message and convince runners, you know, you need to think of your the brain as the hub. Of the entire running experience, and 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 think about the practical implications uh, of that. And you know, I'm I'm really interested in brain science, but I, I don't. I I wanted to tackle it in a way where you know, even if you're, you know, a, a poet who doesn't care about <laughs> brain science at all, you can still you can still benefit from the practical side of it. Yeah, absolutely, and it uh, makes makes a lot of sense. That's great. Um, now again, a kind of a kind of abrupt subject change, and this will this will kind of wrap up the interview. And thank you so much for your time today. Uh, let's say we've got you know a, a young listener out there, or maybe not even all that young, but they want to enter the endurance riding world. What are what are some best practices or, or tips that you can offer to them as they kind of try to get into that realm? Yeah. So. Um you know, it's funny. I, I think of endurance sports training and, and riding as being very, very similar. Um, you know, it's both require a lot of discipline. Um, both require a lot of patience. You know, you know, I've written all these books, and I don't 
I don't write a book in a day. You know what I mean? You know, it just take. I have to break them down into bite-sized chunks. And, and training for a marathon is very similar, right? You know, you have this vision of how fit you want to be in order to achieve your goal, but you can't try to get there in tomorrow's workout. You have to break it down into little bits. Um, and so, you know, if, if you're if you already have the the running piece that you understand, like taking that framework and approaching writing in almost the same way can, can really help you. A lot of, a lot of writers, you know, they, um, they, uh, they get caught up in, um, they get kind of emotional, like, of like fearing deadlines or feel it, fearing the scope of projects or, or whatever. But you really, you know, just the way you sort of, you know, focus just on the next mile marker or, you know, completing the next lap, mm -hmm. um, writing, it really helps to just be patient and, and be persistent. Um, and, you know, what I found my, for myself is that, you know, writing about anything, including endurance sports, it, it's a challenge, challenging way to make a living. Um, <clears throat> but you know, in my in my 20s, I, you know, I was struggling, um, you know, eating a lot of ramen noodles for, for dinner <laughs> and stuff like that. But I was persistent, you know, that that is what I wanted to do. And I knew it. <clears throat> and guess what? A lot of the people who wanted to do the same thing um, ended up deciding it was too hard for them. And they quit to become lawyers or whatever and they're making more money than I am now but I'm probably happier than they are so you know just recognizing that that you know just because it's you know you know really hard today and you can't see the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow or that's probably the wrong metaphor but um, yeah so you know patience and persistence approaching writing the way you do running uh, will take you far so to speak cool yeah that's that's great advice um Thanks so much for your time today. Uh, I don't. I don't think I necessarily missed anything that we talked about before. Um, so, listeners, that was Matt Fitzgerald on the Runners Connect Run to the Top podcast. Any of the resources that we mentioned will be available at runnersconnect.net/rc32. That's the letter R, the letter C, and then the number 32. Um, so, runnersconnect.net/rc32, and we'll have of links to both the video of this interview and then uh, all of the resources that we talked about, including um, the books that we talked about and, and uh, wh where you can buy those. Um, once again, thank you so much today, Matt. Um, thank you, Will. I really enjoyed our chat. Yes, sir. Uh, and listeners, have a wonderful day. <laughs>